We're going to take you back inside the sessions. The continuation talking about nutrients in the Great Lakes with the Great Lakes Commission with the IJC. And, it, and it's getting more and more interesting. And we can sit around and, and um, you know, we can blame it on, I don't know, the Detroit River. We can blame it on uh, municipalities with combined overflow systems. We heard about lawn fertilizers. We've heard about detergents. But uh, here in Ohio, we're taking very aggressively uh, looking at uh, the agricultural situation. And uh, we have uh, about four and a half million acres of prime farmland that, that does drain into the western basin of Lake Erie. And 35 years ago, we asked those farmers to uh, put away your plows, uh, go to no-till, uh, watch, reduce your phosphorus, uh, the, the, what you're using. They've done all that. They've done everything we've told them. So what's changed? Uh, 35 years ago, Lake Erie was on a big rebound, and, and Dr. Reuter will talk about that in a minute. But there, there's some things that have changed over the years. Maybe no-till wasn't the greatest thing in the world to, to promote. And now we're seeing that the phosphorus is sometimes in the upper two inches of the soil instead of, instead of down in, in the... Uh, in the tilt part down in the 8, 9, 10, 12 inches. Um, so there's, there's things we have to look at. One of, the, one of the big things that have changed over 35 years, and it was mentioned earlier, is the, uh, the addition of field tiles. Uh, field tiles are a great farming tool, a great farming tool. Uh, they're tax deductible for one. Uh, they, they move the water off your field in a hurry. Uh, they they uh, take away the, the washed out and the wet areas in your field. You can get on the farms, uh, you can get on your fields a lot earlier now in March and April instead of uh, mid-May. So there's a lot of good advantages of field tiles. And so we, we have a lot of work to do on why is this possible issues. Because we've been told phosphorus doesn't move. We were told up about five years ago by uh, our leaders in agronomy, whether they be at Ohio State or, or people that did our soil testings, yeah, don't worry about phosphorus, it doesn't move, but it does. And, and maybe the field tiles is the impetus behind that, we don't know. Uh, their OSU and Libby Dayton is doing some great research on edge of field that might help us get a better picture on that. So we have a, a great panel today, uh, Dr. Reuter and Carl Gephardt, two experts in this field. Uh, we have learned a lot from Grand Lake St. Mary's, where I live, pretty close to it, an inland lake in uh, western Ohio, uh, about a 13, 14,000 acre lake with a 50,000 acre watershed that has a hot lot of uh, livestock and a lot of small farms. Here we, in the Great Lakes watershed, we have, uh, or the western basin of Lake Erie, we have a different type of watershed. We have larger farms and not much livestock. So we, we, we don't have... Uh, comparables except phosphorus is phosphorus and that's what we really need to get a better handle on. So we have two good guys here today that are going to talk about it, um, Dr. Reuter and Carl Gephardt. So at this time I'm going to uh, let Carl Gephardt introduce himself, tell a little bit about himself and then we'll go to Dr. Reuter. So Carl. Thank you, Director. Um, I'm Carl Gebhardt. I'm currently serving as Deputy Director for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And uh, in addition to that, I serve as our Chief for the Division of Soil and Water Resources, which is the uh, primary division within ODNR dealing with the ag nutrient issue. Uh, prior to my work um, uh, coming back to ODNR, actually, I had a, a private consulting business for 12 years. I was with the Ohio Farm Bureau for 18 years and uh, spend a little bit of time with the Department of Agriculture as well. So agriculture and natural resources has been pretty much my career, and it's a uh, privilege to be here today. Okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Reuter. Uh, thank you, Director Zeringer. My name is Jeff Reuter. I'm the director of uh, four programs at Ohio State University, including the Ohio Sea Grant College Program and Stone Laboratory on Gibraltar Island at Putin Bay. Uh, I've been really got all three degrees working on Lake Erie, started working on the lake in 1971. Uh, in the last uh, uh, year, I've spoken on this issue over 100 times, uh, including uh, in the last 20 days, uh, we've had two days of agricultural leaders out at the laboratory, two days of science writers and outdoor writers at the laboratory, uh, congressional aides at the laboratory, charter captains, coastal county commissioners, mayors, decision makers, 
So we're trying to get the word out to the people that can make a difference. Well, Dr. Reuter, I know uh, uh, the Ohio Sea Grant, sea Grant Program and Stone Lab has uh, really been a great resource uh, for the state of Ohio and for the Lake Erie region. And I know you have uh, some power, a PowerPoint you want to show with us. So before we get into any kind of discussion, because I think a lot of them you're going to hit on the topics, and what we'll do is we'll watch your program and then we'll open it back up for discussion, okay? Great, thank Go you very much. Go ahead and start. Mm -hmm. uh, I should also add, uh, one of the things I'm frequently asked is, is are we taking this seriously? And is the agricultural community taking this seriously? And, and I can honestly answer that I think they are. Are we gonna move fast enough? And that's a very great challenge. On one side, we're thinking this might take five years to solve if we're dealing with agricultural leaders, if we're dealing, if I'm, if I'm dealing with the tourism industry, uh, the, the charter captains, uh, the people from Cedar Point, they're willing to wait about five minutes. Uh, so really that to me is the challenge that's in front of everyone in this, in this room uh, because you are the policy makers and I think we're ready for policy. On the state side, we've had a phosphorus task force, the first version that released a report in 2010, the summer of 2010. At the same time, we came out with uh, a synthesis report documenting some key results from eight different research projects. We're now in the middle of a second phosphorus task force, and we've also had an agricultural working group that uh, have really come up with some good information. And, and I was pleased to serve for 21 years on the Council of Great Lakes Research Managers for IJC uh, and many years as the uh, U.S. Chair of that. And the only reason I resigned from the, 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 the IJC was I needed to spend more time working on this particular issue. Uh, so I'm going to go real rapidly through this, tell you a little bit about Lake Erie. I'm going to give you the science. I was asked to speak of the state of the science in Lake Erie, so I'm going to talk about a number of issues, some of which have already been covered. And I'm going to also uh, tell you, I, I, uh, if you go to our website um, and you click on contact and then click on my name, you will be able to find this PowerPoint and a number of others that, uh, that I've presented and I, and I release you to it. use them. Uh, I've already seen several of the slides today and the, uh, uh, they're there to be used and to help people understand. Okay, when we look at Lake Erie, we know it's the southernmost. And if we look at in cross-section, we also know it's by far the shallowest. Uh, the other lake's all over 750 feet deep. The deepest spot in Lake Erie is 210 feet. So if we're southernmost and the shallowest, we've got to be the warmest. And if we look at the lake from above and in cross-section now, you see you've got a western basin west of Sandusky, a central basin between Sandusky and Erie, and an eastern basin uh, 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 east of Erie. And the western basin is by far the shallowest, uh, uh, average depth less than, less than 24 feet. The deep spot's about where the B in the eastern basin is, and that's about 210 feet deep. And you compare that to 1,333 feet for Lake Superior, and this is much smaller. Lake Superior is 20 times larger in volume than Lake Erie. The vast majority of the water that comes into this lake flows into the western basin. You can see that it's not only a small basin by area, but it's a small basin by volume. It's not very deep, and all the water flows in there, which means things in the western basin happen very fast. That water is going to move out of that basin very quickly. Retention time for water in Lake Erie is about 2.6 to 2.7 years, but retention time for water in the western basin is 20 to 50 days. Not only is it southernmost and shallowest, but the watershed around Lake Erie is very different than the other watersheds. And to simplify it, we have the least forest and the most agriculture. That means we're going to get more sediment, we're going to get more nutrients, we're going to get more pesticides. Those things are going to be exacerbated by severe storms. But if we are southernmost, shallowest, warmest, and we get the most nutrients, then biologically, Lake Erie has to be the most productive of the Great Lakes. And by far, it is uh, often exceeding the fishery production of the other four Great Lakes combined. 50 and 2 rule, uh, Lake Superior, this is not exact, but it's instructive. Lake Superior, 50% of the water, 2% of the fish. Lake Erie, 2% of the water, 50% of the fish. If you look at where the water in Lake Erie comes from, about 80% is coming in from the upper lakes through the Detroit River. 
about 10 percent from direct precipitation, 10 percent from the Lake Erie tributaries themselves, the, the largest of those tributaries, and in fact the largest tributary to the Great Lakes is the Maumee River, but it brings in only 3 percent of the flow into uh, Lake Erie. What that tells you is that the Great Lakes are fed by a bunch of really small tributaries. The biggest one is the Maumee. It brings in 3 percent of the flow, but it drains 4.5 million acres of agricultural land. Biggest issues facing the lake right now, you can read more about these in the uh, summer issue of our newsletter, Twine Line, but sedimentation, phosphorus and nutrient loading, harmful algal blooms, aquatic invasive species, dead zone, climate change makes those other, the others worse, and obviously coastal economic development, and how do we do it wisely? If we look at, uh, I, in fact, I used to tell people, this, uh, this is a typical image from April of uh, Lake Erie. I could take the year off that. Basically, it looks like this every April. And I used to say there's no other place in the Great Lakes that looks, that looks like this. And, and quite frankly, that's still most of the time very true. But there was a heck of a load, if any of you had a chance to look at it, a very large load that went in at Duluth. Uh, in a particular uh, runoff event. Didn't look brown like this. It's my understanding it was more red. But uh, uh, this is typical. This is not un unusual. A huge um, amount of sediment enters Lake Erie. We think about nutrients, and often what that word makes us think of good things. And so are they a problem or a benefit? You put them on your lawn, it's going to make your grass grow. You put them in the water, it's going to make the algae grow. Lake Erie is the most productive because we get the most nutrients and we're southernmost, we're warm, we're shallow. But it's really possible to have too much of a good thing and that's what happens when, when phosphorus loading gets too high, we get too much algae and we get the wrong kinds of algae. And when we look at Lake Erie and all the lakes, Lake Erie is just an example here, but, but all the lakes, there's hundreds of kinds of algae and most of them are very beneficial. Typically we look at three major groups uh, diatoms being the cold water forms, uh, the greens being sort of your cool water forms, and then the real warm water forms are the cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. Lake Erie was really the poster child for pollution problems in, in the world, really, in uh, 1969 when the Cuyahoga River burned. Uh, you think of the things that happened the very next year, that uh, particular burning uh, received a lot of coverage in a very popular issue of Time magazine because of other things that were going on in August of 1969. Uh, but the very next year we have US EPA formed, NOAA is formed, and we have the first Earth Day. Uh, and then by the mid-1980s, the lake goes from being a dead lake to the walleye capital of the world, and quite frankly, the best example in the world of ecosystem recovery. Unfortunately, Starting in 1995, it started going back the other way. We brought about the, the rebirth. You've heard a little bit of this already, but essentially re, we reduced the loading, and this is total phosphorus now, from 29,000 metric tons down to 11,000 metric tons. And that was done primarily by improving sewage treatment, but even in those days, agriculture reduced its loading by about 50% because that's the time that we were first implementing the no-till farming. This is uh, my hand in front of Stone Lab in 1971. This gives you an example of what it looked like at that time. Uh, you saw an er earlier image of my hand in front of the lab in 2010. Uh, not a whole lot of difference. The arm looked older in 2010, the, uh, the, but the watch was better. Uh, uh, we, we target phosphorus. It's normally the limiting nutrient in fresh water. If we were in salt water, we'd be focused on nitrogen, but quite frankly, limiting both of them would help, and it's likely nit nitrogen that determines which of the uh, different species of blue-green we end up getting. These HABs uh, require warm water and high concentrations of phosphorus, and they don't care where that phosphorus comes from. Uh, if you get a, a, a lot of uh, agricultural runoff and phosphorus, you're going to get a bloom. If you have poor sewage treatment, you're going to get a bloom. And if you're in a rural area and you have a lot of uh, lawn fertilizer being applied incorrectly or the wrong kinds of lawn fertil wrong fertilizers, you can get a bloom. And there's really only half a dozen, maybe 10 species that can bloom. 
These are not invasive species, species, they're natural. The way to prevent them from blooming, I don't think any of us, well, we can either make it colder or we can reduce the amount of phosphorus and you decide which is more likely. If we look at the cyanobacteria or the blue-greens themselves, three real common ones that, uh, that, that we see in Lake Erie and in a lot of other lakes, anabena, aphanizomenon, and microcystis. Uh, microcystis is the one that has been blooming most frequently in Lake Erie along with anabena. When we have lots of nitrogen, we get microcystis. When we have a limit on nitrogen, we get anabena because anabena is capable of fixing its own nitrogen from the atmosphere. Phanazomenon is the one that was a big bloomer in uh, Grand Lake St. Mary's in 2010 and it's what I had my hand in in Lake Erie in 1971. In the 60s and 70s, most of that load was coming from point sources, at least two-thirds of the load. Today, at least two-thirds of the load is coming from uh, agriculture. Now we're looking at total load going in. If we, if we look at just the Maumee River, which is probably, not probably, which is the biggest contributor, the load there from, uh, from, from agricultural runoff is greater than two-thirds. But if you go to the Cuyahoga, for instance, the load there would be more toward uh, uh, urban and suburban runoff. Uh, if we're trying to reduce the loading, we need to be looking at sewage treatment and combined sewer overflows, lawn fertilizers, water treatment plants, and septic tanks in addition to agriculture. Can't be solved just by ag. The microcystin concentrations have gotten to dangerous levels. Uh, this is one of four toxins that these blue-greens are capable of producing. Some of these toxins, like saxitoxin, are actually terrorism agents. Uh, the one that we know most about is microcystin, and we don't know enough about that. World Health Organization recommends one part per billion for drinking water, 20 parts per swimming. Uh, Last year in Lake Erie, it had reached 1,200, and in Grand Lake St. Mary's in 2010, it was over 2,000. It's not just an Ohio or in a Lake Erie problem, it's really a global problem. Uh, we've done a number of special workshops uh, for water treatment plant operators and for uh, uh, managers, uh, state managers uh, at Stone Laboratory, and had people literally come from all over the country to participate in those. Uh, and it's not just a Great Lakes issue, uh, it's a U.S., Canada, and it's a lot of our inland lakes are also getting this. Uh, other places that it's most likely to occur in, in, the, in the Great Lakes, Green Bay, Saginaw Bay, Lake St. Clair, nutrient-enriched harbors. You know, you pick the shallow, warmest, most nutrient-enriched places, those are where it's most likely to occur. Uh, target load to solve the problem right now, looking at loading, uh, we're suggesting that it's gonna take about a two-thirds reduction in the load, uh, which, if you think about what we did in the 1970s when we solved the problem the first time, and we went from 29,000 metric tons to 11,000 metric tons, about the same magnitude of reduction. Uh, dissolved phosphorus, or the, the, the form, the, the reason we're so concerned with dissolved phosphorus and, or soluble reactive phosphorus is that another way of thinking of that is think of it as bioavailable phosphorus. When you look at total phosphorus, typically about 30% of it is bioavailable, but on the soluble reactive, the dissolved, almost all of that is, uh, is bioavailable. So it's the kind that the algae is gonna use. The white line here tells you what the loading was from the Maumee River uh, in 2010. That was a record until the yellow line, that was 2011, we set another record. We know that the majority of the load comes in during storm events. 80 to 90% comes in 10 to 20% of the time. That's what really caused the most severe problems that we had in 2010. The picture with my hand in the water that was shown earlier with the watch on, that was from August, I wanna say August 10th maybe of 2010. Uh, last year, it would have been even worse. Uh, even I have limitations on what I'll stick my hand into. Uh, the 2012, uh, totally different situation this year because we're in the middle of a drought, been a dry spring, been, been, 
bad for agriculture, but it's been a very good thing for Lake Erie. Some typical, this is an early 2000s bloom, and recognize these blooms started coming back in 2002. This is what it looked like coming out of the Maumee River. You'll also see a bloom down here in uh, uh, Sandusky Bay. So the Sandusky River, the Maumee River, primarily agricultural uh, 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 tributaries, and the Sandusky Bay is even shallower than Maumee Bay, so it's uh, confined. You're going to have a very warm water and a high concentration of nutrients. Blooms in both places but the flow from the Maumee is much greater than the flow from the Sandusky, and you can see the bloom extending out into the lake. That's what it looked like in the early and mid-2000s. This is what it looked like in uh, August of 2011, and now we're covering almost the whole basin. You can still see relatively clear water coming in, but on the Canadian side, recognize that the Thames River also drains, drains lots of agricultural land, and you see a bloom up here. Uh, in uh, Lake St. Clair, this is where the, ten, the Thames feeds in. And this actually twists around, and we can often f uh, follow it along the shoreline on the north side. This surprised us. I've been telling people for a number of years that this bloom is going to begin to move from the western basin into the central basin. Uh, we started seeing that in 2009, but we have never seen anything like this. And this goes back to the 1970s when we were in the dead lake years. We never had blooms like this. At this point, we have a bloom that is moved out of the western basin. When it hit the central basin, it expanded. Uh, afterwards, we can talk about some reasons why that likely occurred. You also see fingers of the blooms com bloom coming down on the north shore. And at this point, we've covered, the, you know, this is not just a fishing issue at this point, because we've covered the water intakes now with the harmful algal bloom producing toxins, and we've covered the intakes for 2.8 million people. This is what it looked like in the bloom, and I honestly, I've never seen a bloom like this, because uh, blue-greens are typically floaters, but this bloom was thick enough and dense enough that when you hit it with a boat, it slowed you down. This is what it looked like a little earlier at Putin Bay in, in September, where Stone Lab is, uh, is located. This is the downtown docks at Putin Bay in September, and there are no boats there. And typically, this area has 800,000 visitors per year. Uh, this is what it looked like in front of our research building uh, on, on, on uh, uh, South Bass and on Gibraltar. You've seen this one already. These are the blooms from 2002 to 2010. Now I'm going to show you what the bloom from 2011 looked like. It's essentially two and a half times worse than anything we had seen in the past. Uh, in fact, if we take uh, the biomass in that bloom, pick the worst 30-day biomass of that bloom, and compare it with the previous four worst years, and the biomass produced in the 2011 year was worse than the biomass produced in the previous four worst years. Uh, we often have said that harmful algal blooms was primarily a western basin problem, but they contribute to the dead zone in the central basin. You kind of see how that could happen. Let me explain the dead zone here. Uh, the central basin, very, very shallow, uh, or not as shallow as the western basin, but average depth 60 feet. The thermocline typically forms 50 feet from the surface, which means we have a very thin, cold bottom layer, 10 feet thick. Uh, it's very easy if we put a lot of biomass in there, the decomposition by bacteria of that algal material will consume all the oxygen. And when that happens, we refer to it as the dead zone. There's no oxygen. The water's real stinky. Uh, the phosphorus that has previously been in the sediments redissolves back into the water. Uh, metals redissolve back into the water. That is not at all a, a good place to be. Uh, but dead zones refer, uh, occur literally all around the country. They're, they're pretty common. Uh, the way to eliminate the dead zone is reduce the amount of biological material we put into it. Quite honestly, I believe it's 100% uh, possible to eliminate harmful algal blooms. I don't know that it's ever going to be possible to totally eliminate the dead zone. But if we eliminated harmful algal blooms, we would greatly improve the dead zone. The, uh, the algal material and all the phosphorus that entered the western basin in the record loads from 2000 
11, moved into the central basin, sunk, and were, and were deposited at the bottom. Climate change makes these worse. We know warm water favors the blooms. We also know that uh, we're going to get more frequent severe storms as one of the, 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 the major issues that goes along with climate change. And when we look at the period from 1960 to 2010, no matter what measure we look at to measure the significance of uh, increased runoff, the, the, the frequency of severe storms, everything is up by somewhere between 25 and 75 percent. If we look now, the, that, that, that was the Maumee. If we look at the Midwest as a whole, again, from 20, uh, 1960 to 2010, and we look at the increased frequency of severe storms or very large runoff events, you see that the runoff events of one inch per day uh, or under one inch per day, they're pretty much the same, haven't seen a big change. But when you get up to the runoff events that are over three inches per day, the last decade, you got a 52% increase in those. And the decade uh, from the 1990s to 2000, he had a 30% increase. So the trend is really in the wrong direction on the increased frequency of severe storms. Most of us probably have difficulty feeling the increased warming. This July might be a difference. But the, uh, the increased frequency of severe storms, most of us can feel that. Expected time to recovery. If we could, what we have told people in the past is that we believe that if we could reduce the loading to the western basin by about two-thirds because the retention time for the water, because things pass through that basin so quickly, we could eliminate the harmful algal blooms from the western basin almost immediately. Nature gave us the perfect experiment this year. If you look at uh, loading or the discharge now, the amount of water coming in out of the Maumee River from 2011, the top line, 2012, the bottom line. This is the loading of total phosphorus from 2011, top line again, 2012, the bottom line. If we look at dissolved reactive or the soluble bioavailable phosphorus, the same trends. A whole lot le le less went in this year. Uh, NOAA, we've been working with NOAA and University of Toledo and Heidelberg, and we've uh, come up with a model, and we did a press conference with NOAA at Stone Lab on July 5th. And, and what, we, what we believe now is that the load of phosphorus that occurs from March through the end of June determines the amount or the size, the significance of the harmful algal bloom. Uh, Heidelberg data has been able to show us that the load of phosphorus, the amount going in, uh, this, this year, 2011, during, I'm sorry, 2012, during that period of time was the lowest it's been in 40 years. The University of Toledo data was able to confirm that in Maumee Bay, where we had concentrations of phosphorus that were one-tenth. So no, we get um, low rainfall, we're getting less agricultural runoff. The bloom then, we predicted the bloom would be less than 10% of what it was in 2011, and that is about uh, the amount that occurred in 2007. This is, we're not saying there wouldn't be a bloom. This was the bloom from 2011. Uh, what we expected was a bloom about this size. What we're actually getting is probably a bloom about this size. It's a little bit larger. There's a bloom going on in Maumee Bay right now. Um, now, all of this in entirely uh, um, science-based information. Now, I'm going to give you a science-based now, but a little bit of speculation on, I think, what's happening. And this is based on our understanding of the lake. This is what happened, this is what it looked like in the, the mid-2000s. Okay, now we get a record load of phosphorus that goes into the lake in 2011. Re that the amount that went in, remember our spring of 2011 set all kinds of records, not just on load, but it's like the wettest spring in history. So we got a giant bloom. That giant bloom left the western basin, moved into the central basin where it sunk to the bottom. So we had a whole lot of phosphorus, a whole lot of algae, moves out of the western basin, sinks to the bottom in the central basin. Then we get record loads of phosphorus into the lake in the fall of 2011. Now this is after the time that we would expect to find harmful algal blooms. 
but this is what we saw in January and in March in Lake Erie. Uh, now these are not, har this is an algae bloom, but it's not harmful forms of algae. So we're getting an algal bloom at a time we typically don't get blooms, but we had a record loading back in the fall. So the next thing we expect to be able to say is that essentially the load, the, 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 the phosphorus that comes, or no, say it a different way, uh, probably two months after a, a major load of phosphorus, you're going to see some kind of a bloom of, bloom of algae. Uh, so if we had a record spring and fall load of phosphorus and harmful algal blooms during the, during the summer, all that passed through the western basin into the central basin, because retention time for water in the western basin, 20 to 50 days. Retention time for water in the whole lake, 2.6 to 2.7 years. So when it hits the central basin, things slow down. It's going to stay there for a long time. Improving the central basin is a much greater challenge to improve than improving the western basin. But it would be even worse if we did this on any of the other lakes because the retention time on all of those lakes is much greater than the retention time on Lake Erie. So we know all that material moves into the central basin, it rests on the central basin. So what happens as a result of that? This is a bloom in the central basin this past July. This is really unusual. We don't see this. I got a call on uh, the 4th of July and, and they said at uh, Fairport that they were having a bloom. And my initial thought is, okay, this is a small bloom in the harbor, there's been some kind of a, sm a spill. No, this was a bloom that was 50 miles long and 20 miles wide. Uh, anabina, the kind of algae that requires uh, additional nitrogen and likely the kind that would grow if we had an upwelling event or a release of phosphorus that had been deposited in the sediment of the lake. So the, the things that we do in the western basin, if we reduce loading there, we can eliminate those blooms, but if we've done a whole lot of damage to the central basin, it will take longer to eliminate this. So there's really no good time to put phosphorus into the lake. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much, Jeff. Maybe we can turn the lights up a little bit now. I do have an update from my wife. She has lost the $290 that she won earlier. <laughs> uh, very good information. Uh, Dr. Reuter, can we just probably rule out that, I mean, do we need any more scientific evidence that it's phosphorus? Uh, no, it, it's, okay. this is, it's definitely phosphorus, uh, but, but we do know that uh, when, as an example, th there are times um, that uh, in August that ac this actually occurs. The, the, the blooms will take off and they'll, they'll grow with microcystis, the one that doesn't need uh, or that is not capable of producing its own nitrogen from the atmosphere, of fixing its own nitrogen. So the bloom takes off until all the phosphorus is gone, or I'm sorry, until all the nitrogen is gone. And at that point, that bloom is nitrogen limited. There's a lot of phosphorus available, there's not enough nitrogen for that bloom. But often when that happens, all of a sudden we see anabina start to appear. And then anabina blooms because anabina can get the nitrogen that it needs from the atmosphere. So it's, the best thing to do is reduce both, both of them, but the target should definitely be phosphorus and it should be soluble reactive phosphorus. It's amazing how similar Grand Lake St. Mary's is. It's a very shallow lake, averages probably right around five feet. Uh, the lake was dug by hand uh, in the 1840s. Uh, it's a feeder lake for Lake Erie, or for the, I'm sorry, for the Erie Canal. And uh, a lot of similar, but they both started seeing issues right around 2000, 2001. And, and uh, we really started uh, uh, trying to address the issues uh, pretty aggressively. And two years ago we did. And it's very reassuring to hear Dr. Reuter uh, say that we can, we can, we can nip this in the bud. I mean, it may take a little time, but it's not like it's 50 years out. 
and, and that's why uh, Carl Gephardt is here also, and, and he's going to talk a little bit about what we're doing here in Ohio to aggressively look at on-the-farm practices that we can uh, work with the farmers. Again, 35 years ago, we, they did everything we told them. Go no-till, reduce phosphorus. Like you heard, phosphorus was reduced by 50%. So the thing we have to work out now, we don't want to pit big versus small. There's a lot of advantages to both. And we have to recognize there are some times that you need to top dress wheat and you need to do things on the surface. But the more and more that we're looking at this, tillage of some sort is, is very, uh, uh, very wisely used in certain circumstances. So Carl, can you tell us what we're doing right now to uh, uh, look at this issue, what we're doing right now on the ground? You bet, thanks. Thanks, Director. Um, what we're looking at it is what systems do we have in place that we can utilize so we don't spend a lot of time and effort trying to recreate and develop new programs, new, new structures. In Ohio, and I'm sure in many of your other states, we have uh, soil and water conservation districts. These are the, the folks at the county level that are working with the farmers every day. They know them, the farmers trust them, and, and they feel good about them. And so we said, you know, we have to use that system. I mean, it just makes sense for us to utilize our soil and water districts in, instead of going out and creating some new entity to try to address this issue. Um, Director, if you want, I can get into the uh, Director's Ag Nutrient Working Group, which really got this going. But, yeah, that uh, would be great if you could talk a yeah, little bit about that. Why don't I go that. ahead and talk a little bit about the Director's Ag Nutrient Working Group. When uh, Governor Kasich came on board uh, and, and recognized the issues that Jeff uh, has pointed out, he went to the three directors, uh, Director of Ag, at, which at that time was Director Zerringer, uh, Director of EPA, and Director of Natural Resources, and basically said, fix it. And if you know our governor, uh, he doesn't kid around. Uh, you know, he was serious. Uh, we had a big issue going on. At that point in time, it was Grand Lake St. Mary's primarily, but we knew that it was also starting to take place in Lake Erie. And so the, um, the three directors got together and formed the Director's Ag Nutrient Working Group. Now this wasn't a group because of the governor and, and his approach to this, where we were just gonna sit around and talk about stuff and, and have great presentations and, and say, wow, you know, uh, maybe we should form another task force to look at this down the road. This was an action-oriented organization. It started out with seven groups attending these meetings. It then grew to 125. All of a sudden, a lot of people had a lot of interest because they knew something was going to happen as a result of this uh, activity. And so um, in March of 2012 of this year, uh, a report was filed, it was issued by the uh, director's working group that focused in the areas of research, education, policy, and practices. What would need to be done in each of those areas to address the issue of ag nutrients? And so uh, that was done in March of 2012, and here we are, September of 2012, and I'm proud to report we have made uh, what we consider some pretty good progress on getting practices on the ground. And that's really the approach we've been talking about. You know, we know that the, the research is there, we know what the problems are, we know it's coming, yes, from agriculture, yes, there are some other sources, um, we know there's some sensitivities in the agricultural community that they're sort of being singled out, but we have to get beyond that. We have to work through those issues and start addressing the issue. Would it be nice to have 10 years where we could study this issue and, and do some long-term research to find out what practices are the right practices and what soils are the right practices? It would be great, and we are gonna be doing that. I'll talk, touch on that in a little while. But we felt that you know, we knew enough about some good agronomic practices that could be put in place that just might help the problem. And so that was the approach we took. It was almost a ready, fire, aim approach where we didn't know exactly and we just didn't have the luxury of a lot of time as Jeff alluded to. Uh, a lot of folks out there wanted to take their grandkids to the beach or they wanted to go and catch a walleye and they didn't want to deal with this, uh, this issue that we uh, were gonna take 10, 15 years to study. As a result of the combination of the Ag Nutrient Working Group, um, Randy Gardner, a state representative from up in Northwest Ohio, took it upon himself to say, you know, it's one thing to have a good plan and want to do some things, but even as a conservative Republican, I know I, we need to have some funds to do this. 
And I'm willing to go to bat, and in our mid-budget review, he put $3 million in the budget, directed a Healthy Lakes initiative to put practices on the ground to try to address this issue. Now, I was in the office when Director Zeringer got the call from Randy saying, hey, would you mind if I put $3 million in the, bu the budget to go to you to help address this issue? Well, here you are on one hand with the governor saying, we got to cut spending, but on the other hand, we've got to solve the problem. And to his credit, Governor Kasich said, you know, this is important enough, I'm going to let this one go through. He didn't let all those other uh, amendments go through with spending, but this one he did. And uh, so it provided us with $3 million up front to start putting practices on the ground. We created the Ohio Clean Lakes Initiative, which focused on Lake Erie, but also was there to address the other lakes in Ohio. Uh, as Director Zeringer pointed out, we had Grand Lake St. Mary's, our largest inland body of water, 13,500 acres, uh, average depth about five, six feet, and uh, in the watershed of about 47,000 acres is the largest concentration of livestock in Ohio, and possibly even the Midwest. And we had a real problem there as well. So we were addressing that issue uh, uh, in addition to looking at um, Lake Erie. Now, as the director mentioned, we have you know, four million acres going into the western Lake Erie Basin. We have uh, eastern Ohio, which is a different type of agriculture, but they were experiencing some issues, and they actually felt a little left out. They say, wow, we got to go out and find us a problem so we can get some, some of this money as well. Well, we didn't want that to happen. So we said, you know, you're going to have your day. Right now, the focus has to be on the western Lake Erie Basin. And in particular in the Maumee Basin. So we wanted to narrow it down as best we could. We picked five counties, predominantly agricultural counties, where we felt that we had strong support on the part of the soil and water districts. We had some innovative leaders in agriculture who were willing to take a risk and work with us. And it was uh, right in the watershed uh, that we were trying to approach. So we put together our technicians in our division of soil and water. We worked with NRCS, we worked with uh, farmers, and we took the recommendations that came out of that Ag Nutrient Working Group and we put it into practices. We came up with four basic practices uh, that we uh, wanted to market, basically, in that watershed or in those five counties. It would involve variable rate technology with incorporation, and this is being able to put the fertilizer where you need it, but then get it incorporated into the soil. We also looked at variable rate technology, but using cover crops, encouraging farmers after harvest this harvest to go in and plant cover crops to soak up some of those nutrients that are already there, keep the sediment on the ground. Uh, the other one was we know there's still some broadcast fertilizer going on, but we wanted to do the broadcast with incorporation as well. You'll notice a, a, a consistency there. It's that incorporation. The incorporation we felt was important to get that, that fertilizer off the surface of the, of the soil get it down into the, the, the growing zone, but using that variable rate technology where we could place it a little more accurately, that would be helpful as well. And fourth, and one of the most interesting uh, components of, of this program was a, a device called a controlled drainage device. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this device. It's a box that stands about three, maybe four foot high, and it has different removable weirs in it. And what you do is you tap it into your, your drainage tile uh, close to the outlet, and it can literally hold the water back in the field. It backs it up into the drainage system. Now you might say, well, that's counterintuitive. You're, you're wanting to get the water off. Why are you wanting to put a device in there that actually holds the water in the field? Well, one is <clears throat> it provides in a year like this the moisture that is much needed by the farmer. It allows them to control the amount of water that's going in and out of, off that field. Second of all, as Jeff pointed out, when we start seeing the spikes in nutrients is when we have a high rain event. And if we can control that water, ease it into the systems a little bit more instead of just letting that big slug come in to the drainage ditches into the streams, we felt we had a little bit better capability of managing the nutrients as well. We have had reports this year of farmers who have put these devices in on their own, who have uh, soybeans that are four and a half, five feet in height. And, and we have videos of these that we're gonna be showing at our fi farm science review in two weeks. That they say that you know the, this is the, the reason we put these practices in was to help control the moisture in our soil, but it's also done a cr tremendous job of making sure the nutrients stay there as well. So it's a device that if you're not familiar with, if your states aren't familiar with, I'm sure they are, 
um, they need to look at. It's not for every farm. It takes a certain type of slope, certain, certain type of uh, drainage system, but they can be very effective. The other thing you can do to that is you can put a biofilter on. And Ohio State right now is doing some research in this area where they're uh, actually running the, uh, that comes through a drain control drainage device, running through these biofilters. Uh, normally this is used to remove nitrogen uh, and they're wood chips. All they're doing is digging a pit, putting wood chips in, running the water through these. It's taking out the, the nitrogen and we feel it's also impacting on the amount of phosphorus that's, uh, that's going out as well. So this is the type of research that's going on. So here we are, we um, had our study done and now we're out uh, working with our five soil and water districts to try to get these practices on the ground. We have some money in our pocket that we're gonna be able to do some cost share with the farmers and we're not sure just how this program is gonna take off. Well, in less than three months, uh, I'm pleased to say that we've um, so far been able to sign up farmers that cover 13, over 13,000 acres of new acres that will be receiving new conservation practices in that, uh, that five county area. We've also installed over 159, or will be installing 159 controlled drainage devices. And you know, I, I give a lot of credit to the, the soil and water districts and to our technicians. They went out, they were able to make this sale. There were enough of them not being used around the state where farmers were somewhat used to it. They just needed that little incentive to get them over the hump. Now you're saying, well, 13,000 acres, that's great. We, our, our ultimate goal is 35,000 acres uh, in, in about an 18 month period. But um, what we're looking to use these for is just not to protect the 13,000 acres, but now we have some demonstrations that we can bring farmers into and we can have a farmer talking to a farmer saying, you know, this cover crop idea, wasn't sure about it, it worked. These controlled drainage devices, how do you, why do you want to keep moisture, you know, water in your system? You want to get it out, it works. And so the best salesman for a farmer is another farmer. And so we want to utilize these practices as learning and training for other farmers and other soil and water districts to come in and, and show them how it can work. In addition, we have the four R's, which uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with. This is a program that's been put together, uh, actually to the credit of the Fertilizer Institute, that talks about placing uh, the fertilizer in the right place, at the right time, at the right rate, and the right source. Fairly simple concept. Most farmers understand that, but you have to talk about it. We have to be reminded. It's common sense that we have to use our seat belts, but we have to have a law to force us to do it. It's the same thing with the four R's. We have to be out there talking about the type of practices, showing farmers that, you know, this isn't rocket science. This is stuff you're already doing. We just have to think about it. We have to keep better records. We have to do better soil testing so we know how to put our fertilizer on. It's just trusting the co-op that this is what we need at this rate, at this location. So uh, a lot of this is salesmanship. You know, the technology and the practices are there. It's just how do we get the farmers to understand I can economically farm and I can get these practices in. I don't have to really do a lot of new and different things and it's gonna help the environment and it's gonna help agriculture and it's gonna help my bottom line. So that's where we were at. Well, thank you very much, Carl. And, and I'll tell you what, we yep. only have a couple minutes. I want right. to open it up for I questions. But I, I tell you, that th those control drainage uh, structures, that could be one of the really the most innovative uh, tools that we're going to be using here in, in the future. And even though farmers sell it to farmers, Mother Nature, like you said, Jeff, has been our driving force right now because she showed this year you want to keep as much moisture on your land. And it, we went from... Uh, putting a field tile in maybe just a low line area on a 40 acre field to doing that every 50 feet to doing it every 40 feet to doing it every 20 feet. So we have a lot of more uh, avenues and roads for this water to get from uh, our surface into our streams and into our Lake Erie. So we have a, a lot of challenges. Carl, you brought up a lot of good points and I know uh, we're looking at targeting five counties. Uh, only because we're trying to get that 4.5 million acres down, but then we're also looking at sub-watersheds within the watersheds that we can, uh, we have the ability to look at distressed watersheds, which Grand Lake St. Mary's is in, but it was easy to target 
that watershed, whereas when you're talking this many, many million acres, it's, it's a little more challenging, but uh, Carl has the tools to do it. Uh, real quick, uh, Dr. Reuter, before we take questions, if, if you could do more monitoring, um, and if you had uh, more money, what, what would you like to target as far as monitoring? Where do you think we're kind of missing something that we could uh, keep an eye on something coming in or at least have more data? Obviously, we need to keep, uh, we're very fortunate that uh, Heidelberg has been able to maintain a great uh, database of the loads coming in from some of the key tributaries. Need to keep that going. Uh, we're fortunate that uh, uh, in 2011, Ohio EPA reinstituted their nearshore monitoring program. Uh, we need more in the lake monitoring. Uh, we have uh, uh, reestablished our, our water quality lab and put, put more equipment into it at Stone Lab. Uh, we're, we're at a point by the end of November, we should be able to analyze 100, sa or 100 samples per hour for five nutrients. And that's, that's our, our goal. And we've put together with Ohio EPA a partnership with charter captains to help us uh, collect the samples where they will be doing it. But we need that, that the combination of uh, tributary monitoring, near shore, and open lake monitoring. And we're now using satellite data from NOAA to instead of, in the old days, we would monitor at fixed locations at a fixed time. We now know that you need to do event-driven monitoring, what happens during the storms, but we also need to do place-based monitoring, and, so, and we have the capabilities with satellites. So essentially, we need funding to put that entire package together from the land to the near shore to the open lake and have it driven by events and by satellite data that will tell us exactly where to go with our boats. Okay. Well, uh, we only have about two minutes left, and I want to give the last two minutes to the commissioners here and open it up for any questions among you. Yes. I, I'm curious about uh, winter application of uh, fertilizers and whether or not you, you analyze. You talked about the right, the four hours and the right time. I wonder if you're, if you're incorporating that um, uh, within your analysis. It's, I've heard many discussions about whether or not winter application on frozen snow covered ground stays in place. And it, did your committee come to any kind of conclusion of that? Or, or? Yes, and the recommendation is not to. Uh, same with uh, manure. Uh, and that, that's been an, a, a real challenge, is, especially over on Western Lake Erie Bay, or in Grand Lake St. Mary's. We're dealing with two issues. Uh, Grand Lake St. Mary's was manure-driven nutrient loading. In the Western Lake Erie Basin, it's primarily fertilizer. And so, you know, the feeling was that, uh, you know, if you apply it, frozen ground, snow-covered ground, the likelihood that it's just going to wash off is probably going to be a lot greater. And I know NRCS is looking at this under new 590 standards, and uh, so that's what the recommendation is, is not to apply it, which really tightens things up for the farmer. And uh, we're hoping that we can start getting them to incorporate it uh, throughout the year or, you know, right after the growing season instead of waiting. But uh, so much of their business is weather-driven, too. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. We looked at, in the earlier talks, we, we saw how the, uh, in the 70s, we made great progress, um, I think, in, in two ways, in, in, the, in, the, in the single source, um, point source. And that was by putting massive amounts of federal money into uh, wastewater treatment plants, among other things, and also uh, with uh, regulatory uh, laws that didn't give people a chance to decide to opt in or opt out. Uh, can we get where we need to go in the next few years to save the lake without either massive amounts of money or regulation? Can, it, can we do it with education? I think education is the place to start. Uh, two quick answers to that qu question, Commissioner Pollock. By the way, good to see you. The, uh, 
the first one is that I've, I've had this exact discussion with ag economists, and the one thing that they invariably point out is we have uh, mistakenly come to the point in, as a society where we think of incentive, in, incentives as only carrots. And the best incentive programs they continually point out are a combination of an incentive and an equally strong and effective disincentive. And if you have both incentives and disincentives, you can greatly re re reduce the cost of those incentive-based programs. But typically what we do is we think of an incentive program with only money going one way and no disincentives coming back the other way. What would a disincentive look like? There are, a, I, I, uh, it could be a penalty for behaving in a way that was not desirable, uh, but there are a variety of disincentives that can be uh, taxes or uh, 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 the inability to get a, uh, uh, a, a reduced tax. There, there are many, many ones, and, and, and a good ag economist would be a better person to ask that question of than me, uh, but I definitely think that the uh, trying to do this first with an education-based program. When you think of it, it may be impossible to get this size reduction without a regulatory program, and I think we all recognize that. But a, a regulatory program over 70,000 farmers and four and a half million acres would be very expensive to implement and very challenging. So from a societal standpoint, the best, it just makes sense to at least try this with voluntary best management practices and try to get, you know, many farmers consider themselves stewards of the land. And I think, you know, what I tell them when I speak to the farm community is, we're gonna put that to the test. Show me that you really are. Carl, did you wanna weigh in on that? Yeah, I think we have to also, I would agree with Jeff, you always wanna start with the educational side. Um, but we also have to make it, I don't wanna say easy, but, you do have to make it easy. Um, for instance, and, and this is nothing against NRCS by any means. I mean, they have their job to do. But, you know, they're used to doing uh, with equip funding uh, on livestock operations, manure management. So let's shift that over and let's make uh, controlled drainage devices or cover crops or something equip uh, eligible. Well, the process that a producer has to go through to do a CNMP is very rigorous and very drawn out and very complex in the eyes of the farmer. Now, maybe to some it's not. We need to say, what do we really want to accomplish with this comprehensive nutrient management plan? And let's get, as we used to say in agriculture, let's get the hay down to where the calves can eat it, okay? Let's get this information and these processes down to where it's easy for that farmer to get a nutrient management plan done on the farm so we know when to apply fertilizer at what rates, but they can also then apply for some federal funding that's out there, and maybe even state funding, that can help them put these devices in. So I think we have to look at, make sure the process isn't keeping us from making the accomplishments we could. And I, b I believe one of the things that we're really looking at and addressing here in Ohio, and we'll be addressing this aggressively, this in lame duck, is that Phosphorus is phosphorus. You can't write that new comprehensive nutrient management plan if you don't have livestock. So in the Grand Lake St. Mary's watershed, you can't haul manure because it has phosphorus in it on snow covered ground or frozen ground, but you can haul commercial fertilizer. <laughs> it makes no sense. And so these are some of the things we're going to be aggressively handling yet this fall uh, so the farmers can get a firm defense and have a comprehensive nutrient management plan using it with no livestock. So, hey, we are five minutes over. One more question, right here, Jim. Um, more comment. Uh, my good friend Scott Pago with the Michigan Farm Bureau likes to point out that farmers want to do the right thing, and the key is letting the farmers know what the right thing is. And uh, I give both these gentlemen credit for helping the farmer know what to do, because at the end of the game, they are stewards of the land, and they do take that role seriously. So, thank you. Thank you very much. That's a good ending. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you.
Oh, Jim, thank you. And you've been watching live coverage of Great Lakes Week on GreatLakesNow.org. We appreciate you being with us as we kick off Great Lakes Week here in Cleveland, Ohio. And we are hoping that you are going to stay with us over the next three days as we continue to cover Great Lakes issues, some of the problems that are facing the Great Lakes and some of the solutions that are out there. This is a gathering of people from around the Great Lakes Basin. It affects 30 million people, eight states, two provinces of Canada. We're going to be talking to environmental groups. Also, you're seeing the government groups who are joining here today, the International Joint Commission and also the Great Lakes Commission talking about some of the problems in Lake Erie, which would be phosphates and uh, nutrient runoffs. We're going to take you now to another session as they start up. Our next session is Ontario's Great Lakes Protection Act. Go ahead and take a listen. And the like, so thank you very much. Um, now I'm also pleased to announce our next speaker uh, who will discuss some recent activities in Ontario. Uh, Mr. Paul Evans is the Assistant Deputy Minister of the Integrated Environmental Policy Division of the Ontario Ministry of the Environment. Um, Paul, as I understand it, has been instrumental in the development of both the Great Lakes Protection Act, which we'll hear about, and the Great Lakes Strategy, uh, as well as leading negotiations for the renewed Canada-Ontario Agreement uh, respecting the Great Lakes Basin ecosystems. Um, Paul, uh, thanks for being willing to, to bring us up to date on your most recent efforts. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, the presentation is in the blue kits that I think uh, delegates were given and there also were copies of the uh, draft legislation and strategy that were also put on commissioners chairs. Um, the purpose really of the, uh, the Great Lakes Protection Act are, were laid out first in the government's throne speech in November 2011 when the province committed to work with environmental experts and community groups to introduce a Great Lakes Protection Act. Um, that was introduced into the legislature in June of this year. At the same time, a draft Great Lakes strategy was released for public comment. The act is uh, about creating opportunities for communities to make improvements in their corner of the Great Lakes, to improve water quality, and to protect beaches, wetlands, and coasts. And I think that we heard a lot of discussion in the previous uh, piece about uh, uh, collaboration, uh, education, uh, and cooperation. I think those are all hopeful hall hallmarks of the act that, uh, that we're working on. Uh, the next slide I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because you all know this uh, much better than I, but some of the current threats to uh, the Great Lakes beach closures uh, from degraded shorelines, uh, algae, invasive species, uh, the impact of population growth. Uh, the loss of natural habitat, uh, new harmful pollutants that we're starting to find in our, uh, in our water, uh, as well as the impact of climate change. Um, the context of the, uh, the proposed act, uh, I think, um, really uh, sits with, uh, nicely with a lot of recent uh, events. Uh, last Friday, Canada and the U.S. Um, negotiated, uh, renegotiated the uh, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement to provide a framework for binational action, a uh, good solid foundation 40 years on. Uh, and Ontario is now working with the Canadian federal government to negotiate uh, a renewal of our Canada-Ontario Agreement on the uh, Great Lakes Ecosystem. That uh, agreement expired in June, uh, but we're hoping to have that new, uh, uh, new agreement in place early in 2013. So with those uh, uh, pieces as backdrop, um, we've been doing extensive consultation um, with a range of groups, uh, Great Lakes municipalities, environmental groups, industry, agricultural and tourism organizations, uh, and have met with First Nations and Métis communities as other, and others uh, to seek input into the, uh, the draft act and the proposed strategy. So in terms of the guiding principles uh, that really, um, that we followed, um, uh, they, we were trying to focus attention, I think, uh, focus action where, um, where it was needed most. So the uh, guiding principle of the act was to really allow us to address priority areas, to really give strategic direction and focus on priority issues uh, and stressed areas um, in those uh, parts of the, the lakes that needed it most. Uh, using a phased approach, so how we could use uh, uh, develop policies and plans over time on a priority basis, 
um, given limited resources. Uh, we also wanted to build on existing tools uh, and governance, and by existing tools, uh, our planning act, our planning statements. Uh, we have a number of pieces of legislation uh, where we may have some tools that can be brought to bear on some of these areas. Uh, key is empowering communities, uh, enabling uh, people in uh, various parts of the lake to take action, uh, to build partnerships uh, around the lake, and to address the cumulative impacts uh, of the um, stressors on the lakes, uh, so really taking an ecosystem approach. Um, in terms of the elements of the proposed act, um, the third bullet really talks about what the purpose is to protect and restore the ecological health of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin and to create opportunities for individuals and communities to become involved in the protection and restoration of the ecological health of the basin. So again, the stress here on local action, uh, collaboration, uh, local partnerships. Uh, there are four key things I would say that the Act uh, contains if, uh, and that would be put in place uh, if passed. The first is establishing a Great Lakes Guardians Council. It's an attempt to bring together all of the players uh, around, uh, around the lake to uh, really improve the level of collaboration uh, to identify uh, pro uh, priorities and partnerships. And I'll speak about that uh, a little further in a moment providing the authority to set Great Lakes targets to help guide actions, um, and following consultation, giving the authority to take phased uh, action within geographically focused uh, initiatives, uh, and also allowing um, the implementation of shoreline protection regulations, if necessary, to protect shorelines, wetlands, and coastal areas in specific areas. Finally, um, the Act establishes the Great Lakes Strategy, a draft of which uh, we've been uh, consulting on over the last number of days. Um, briefly on the Guardians Council, uh, it's really to be a forum for Great Lakes ministers, and by that uh, we're talking about 10 uh, provincial ministries, uh, ministers in, in Ontario who all have a stake in uh, the Great Lakes. Um, so to give a forum to Great Lakes ministers as well as uh, others I, that I mentioned earlier uh, to provide input on uh, priority actions, to identify potential projects, funding measures, uh, partnership opportunities, uh, as well to give input to the Minister of the Environment on uh, issues such as targets, uh, the development of the geographically focused initiatives uh, and uh, interjurisdictional agreements. Uh, and uh, the number of mi uh, those ministries, uh, Great Lakes ministries, are uh, in the second bullet. Um, in terms of geographically focused initiatives, um, again, this is a key tool to um, allow the, the government to take priority action where it's, re where it's really needed most. Um, the one unique feature, I think, about this act is that it, uh, it allows for targeted action as opposed to action uh, generally across the basin. Uh, and those areas could be stressed areas, uh, such as the Thames River or the Grand River. Um, uh, talk was made earlier around some of the um, uh, nutrient depositions from those, uh, those two areas. Uh, or as priority issues uh, to deal with any excessive algae uh, or um, any, um, uh, uh, there's a desire to, to take action to protect important habitat, et cetera. I think the key, folk, uh, uh, key piece here is it's, uh, these geographically focused initiatives are to build on existing work and to align uh, and coordinate efforts. Um, and the other important feature to note here is that these geographically focused initiatives can be developed by the province or by another public body which is named, uh, uh, which is named in the Act. Uh, as I mentioned pre uh, earlier, um, it's important to note that the initiatives include legally enforceable policies so that these can affect government permits and approvals. Uh, for example, uh, if an initiative was to protect a coastal area, um, it could require um, uh, uh, that construction along the shoreline uh, doesn't get too close. Um, it also establishes the ability to uh, uh, create a shoreline regulation, uh, and this would affect uh, develop. This could affect. Uh, development uh, within the shoreline area if that was determined to be uh, a necessary uh, 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 step in uh, addressing one of these geographically focused initiatives. 
Uh, and finally, there are, will also be non-binding uh, uh, policies or commitments, such as programs to promote good stewardship, education and outreach, et cetera, within a geographically focused initiative. Um, the strategy uh, which you have in your package, the draft strategy which you have in your package, was also released at the same time as the, uh, as the act was introduced. Um, and it was very much uh, a collaborative effort across all the Great Lakes ministries within the Ontario government. Uh, and it talks uh, uh, very much about um, the, uh, the science and the environmental conditions within the lake, a summary of the actions that Ontario has taken to date, and an identification of priority actions that we could look at in, uh, uh, in the future. Uh, the focus really is around empowering communities, um, strong emphasis on, on that within the Act as well as the strategy, uh, protecting water through um, work with the municipal water, wastewater and stormwater, improving wetlands, beaches and coastal areas, uh, as well as protecting habitat species, um, very much a focus on science, so enhancing our understanding and adaptation. Uh, uh, with a focus on Great Lakes science uh, and uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, actions, so uh, ensuring that we have uh, actions that are environmentally as well as economically sustainable. Um, you can find more information on the Act. Uh, we've got the web link there. Uh, it's currently in the legislature right now and we are reviewing comments that we've received over the last number of weeks from the Great Lakes strategy, uh, both of which we hope to, um, uh, subject to approval of the legislature, approve the act uh, later this calendar year and hope to finalize our strategy as well at that time. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Do you want me to leave it open for questions or? I, you know, Paul, if there are any quick questions, I think that that would be a really good, good opportunity now if people would like to, uh, um, I guess one question is, is there any money that comes along with it? <laughs> um, there is a, a program that was uh, talking about empowering communities. Uh, the ministries launched a program, uh, the Great Lakes Guardian um, uh, Community Action Fund. Uh, which is really targeted at some of those uh, small localized uh, projects that I was talking about earlier. So there are, uh, within that fund, there are grants up to $25,000 that can be given to local service groups, community organizations, et cetera, to really start looking at some of those beach cleanups, the wetland restoration things. I think what we heard a lot about in our consultations is that sometimes big government dollars um, uh, uh, mean, a lar uh, mean something to a a, a large organization like a municipality, but small amounts of dollars mean a lot to local service groups, et cetera. And so we're really trying to target actions at that level as well. Um, so we've introduced that. It's got enormous um, uh, uh, uptake, a lot of interest in that. Um, we're also continuing, as I said earlier, around our, 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 our Canada-Ontario agreement uh, commitments. Uh, we're continuing to fund uh, those this year, and we're hoping to again, negotiate a, uh, a good, solid agreement with uh, our federal counterparts uh, early in 2013. Thank you, Paul. Yes, Ellen. Just a couple of sentences, if you could help with context. Is, would you characterize this more as, uh, as historically a dispersed number of actions now being kind of threaded together into a whole system approach? I was just searching for this seems very thoughtful and comprehensive, trying to compare it to where you've been. With a the little bit the more basin practice. is about 750,000 square kilometers, and so uh, taking um, action across the basin um, would probably be very inefficient and, and difficult to do and coordinate. And so while it does have a basin-wide uh, emphasis, it does allow us to focus on actions where uh, the science where local community input is telling us uh, that is needed the most. So I think it tries to uh, take a broad view, but also to, to allow us to take um, more focused actions. Any other questions? Paul, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Okay, at this time, um, it's our practice uh, to summarize the action items that will be in front of the commission uh, for your consideration tomorrow. 
Um, as is our practice, we present these items at this time so that you all can be, we can be assured that you've all become familiar with the purpose of the resolutions um, so that the audience knows what we're considering, uh, can ask questions at evening events uh, after we adjourn uh, and the like. Um, I just direct your attention to tab three of the, of the booklet that was passed out. Um, and I also believe that there's a standalone resolution um, that's in your blue folders that was also passed out earlier uh, today. Um, now, when these items are introduced, I'd ask that the commissioners um, you know, have any minor amendments, typographical errors, uh, those sorts of things, um, you know, that we not discuss them right now. You simply bring them to Tim's attention. Uh, we'll handle them and, and, and get them straightened out. Uh, but if on the other hand, and I, I think there'll be, there may be one or two of these here today, if you have objections to the resolution being considered, or if you have a major amendment, for example, uh, um, uh, we ask that you inform us at this time uh, so that we can discuss uh, any uh, you know, potential issues or changes between now and tomorrow morning. Um, and you have been watching live coverage of the Great Lakes Commission and the International Joint Commission discussing Ontario's Great Lakes Protection Act. Here as we cover Great Lakes Week in Cleveland on greatlakesnow.org.